I'll start the presentations. Um, uh, one of the panelists is uh, Manuel Martin Neira, a principal engineer at the European Space Agency. And since 1992, uh, he has led radiometer activities within the payload equipment and technology section at ESO. During this period, he has developed new concepts for constellations of small satellites for Earth observation, and in particular, holds a, a patent for the Paris GNSS reflectometry concept. He's the instrument principal engineer of ESA's soil moisture and ocean salinity, um, and uh, the ESA instrument engineer in the Hydro GNSS mission. Thank, thank you, Manuel, for joining us. Uh, Cynthia Sufada. Uh, she is Associate Chief Scientist at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, as the Laboratory Associate Chief Scientist, uh, she is a key contributor to the strategic planning of science and technology research and development for JPL and managing institutional internal research and development investments. For over 20 years, she has led the Global Navigation Satellite System Reflectometry Technology Development at JPL and has played a pivotal role in demonstrating the feasibility of a remote sensing technique for ocean altimetry and land hydrology. She is currently leading a research group to analyze data from the NASA Cygnus mission uh, to better understand dynamic processes of the terrestrial hydrology. Uh, Joaquin Muñoz Sabate is a scientist at the ECMWF. He is physicist by the University of Valencia, and he conducted his PhD in data simulation of remote sensing uh, for land surfaces at Meteo France. Uh, Joaquin also worked at the European Space Agency involved in the Earth Care mission. For the last 13 years, uh, he's with ECMWF, and currently he leads the ECV program of the Copernicus Climate Change Service. Uh, let me check if uh, we have also John Air with us. Yes, we do. So I can introduce John Eyre. Uh, John Eyre is a MetOffice Fellow in Satellite Applications uh, over, uh, with over 35 years experience in satellite meteorology. Uh, he has held senior positions at the meteorological institution all over the world. He was recently elected to be an honorary fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society. And his current activities include managing research and development, aiming to prepare for the exploitation of data expected from new to soon to be launched satellite instruments and contributing to studies to define future generations of weather satellites and their instruments. And the panel is uh, completed with uh, Nazareno Pierdica, also um, known as Mauro. Uh, he's professor at La Sapienza University of Rome. Uh, he's, um, he performed research in microwave remote sensing, electromagnetic modeling, and their applications. He has been involved in multiple ESA projects working with SAR, radar altimetry, and GNSS reflectometry. Uh, he has also involved with the Hydro GNSS mission from the very beginning. And finally, uh, Martin Unwin, his principal GNSS engineer at SSTL. And Martin has a PhD from the University of Surrey in the exploitation of GNSS receivers for spacecrafts. His team has developed and supplied GNSS receivers for SSTL's own and for many international missions. He init initiated the UK DMC GNSS reflectometry experiment and worked on instruments for TDS-1, Cygnus, and DOT-1, and led the Hydro GNSS bid. So I think I have presented all the panelists now. So with no further delay, uh, what I would like to do is to ask you a few questions. Um, uh, they are all of interest for, for this mission. And um, the first uh, question uh, is uh, the scientific role that you can foresee if uh, uh, that hydrogen SS could play with one or with two satellites. And maybe, uh, maybe uh, John Air, uh, with your background in, in data simulation and in satellite uh, applications for meteorology, maybe you can start giving your opinion or your views on this topic, please. 
Well, thank, thank you very much, Estelle. Um, and I should first say what a pleasure it's been to participate in this workshop. There's been some very interesting material. Um, and the other thing I notice is what great progress there's been since I last saw many of you at the, uh, at the workshop in Benevento. So um, your, your specific question was about one satellite or two. Um, clearly, two will be better, um, but one um, will be um, a, a very good start. Um, I think um, if I'm, it's probably best to elaborate at this stage. I think I don't see that as the key issue for getting um, getting the community involved or for getting um, useful results. Um, I think one of the issues that we haven't really talked about enough is the importance of trying to get some data made, made available in, in real time, in near, near real time. Um, it was stated on the first day that the focus of this mission is climate. Um, and of course, you can have impact on climate research in many ways, but to be most useful for climate, you would like the data or some of the data to be used for climate reanalysis. And if they're going to be used for reanalysis, they have to be made, they have to be assimilated in NWP or similar systems. And so this community needs experience with your products. So I think that that is a very important thing. Um, as suggested yesterday by Clara Chu, for some applications, gridded data are not the best. In NWP, we prefer non-gridded data. We prefer L level two data. In other words, data that's not gridded and not averaged or filtered in time. I hope that makes it easier to make it available um, in near real time. So, um, and the, so the, the two products that I particularly think would be interesting in that mode would be the soil moisture and of course the, the, the ocean surface wind. Timeliness is really important to our community. It's more important than spatial completeness and it's more important than temporal availability. Um, if I understand correctly, the plan is to get the data via Svalbard. In other words, you, you store 100 minutes of data on the satellite and then you download it. And then you have to keep up with the data. You have to process it and in, in time for the next data. Um, so if you have the processing power to keep up with the data, it should be possible to produce some data in near real time. In other words, in, um, in less than three hours. Um, it was great to hear the presentation from Wolfgang Wagner today. And it reminded me that a really good example of what can be done in this area was done by Wolfgang and his colleagues in Vienna in partnership with UMETSAT when they produced a fast track product for ASCAT soil moisture. So ASCAT soil moisture is the soil moisture product that's currently most used in, in NWP. And the generation of that, the time it took to generate that product from Wolfgang's initial demonstration of it to an operational product was really impressive. And I think it's a good example of what can be done and it can be done. So I, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. If we have time at the end, maybe we can uh, talk about uh, the near real time and the timeliness of the data, and also maybe about the, the forward operators that would be needed for, for numerical weather or for data simulation in, in general. Let me let me ask maybe the, the vision of this point to, to Mauro. Uh, I guess it's a, a different perspective. Uh, he's more interested in the level two products. So Mauro, do you want to say something about one to hydrogen SS or many more? Are you muted? Yeah, we don't hear you, Mauro. I think we're muted. Okay, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Estelle. Uh, it is very simple. With the more uh, platform, uh, you may increase, uh, of course, uh, almost proportionally the revisit visit time, that is a temporal resolution. And uh, in this uh, type of application, this, we know this is very important. So I, have not, I, I cannot that, mm, add much to what has been just said by John, uh, as for instance, uh, for uh, numerical weather prediction, or for uh, predicting uh, um, for, um, 
cladding from using uh, uh, hydrological modeling, it is important to have uh, uh, very fresh and very timeliness data. Uh, so for sure, uh, uh, the increasing, it was mentioned today uh, that for instance, 10 platform would be <laughs> really a breakthrough uh, for most of these applications. So the, 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 the answer is quite easy. <laughs> Thank you, Mauro. Uh, the next question is uh, maybe a bit more technical and maybe Manuel and Cynthia that know very well the technique can answer this question. Uh, what, what, what's the benefits and or what are the benefits and the challenges that can be for a SIM with the hydrogen SS new measurements? Who wants to start? Cynthia, do you want to start or Manuel? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Cynthia, clearly. Oh, right. Finally. <laughs> Success, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for having me here. It has been uh, an adventure <laughs> since uh, yesterday I had technical difficulties. So I enjoyed uh, uh, the little that I was able to uh, participate to of the workshop, a very, very interesting, uh, very, uh, uh, very good productive discussions. Uh, um, well, um, let me say that uh, um, I just want to echo a little bit what, uh, you know, others have already pointed out, uh, um, John in particular with, you know, the availability of the data, but I also want to reflect on the fact that this has been the history of this technique, uh, and that is the surprise, right? So we don't know, we didn't know um, at the time when Cygnus was uh, uh, proposed and then implemented that uh, a lot of the, ultimately a lot of the uh, usefulness of the data would have been on the land. It was, uh, it, it was on, in the proposal uh, for sure, but uh, um, and, you know, the mission was designed to do something else. And, uh, um, and so we, we kind of suffered from working with uh, a design that was intended for the ocean when then in fact uh, we were surprised by how well we could use the data on the land. And so um, be prepared for more surprises. And I just want to use this in, uh, you know, as a, as a, not a, certainly I cannot recommend or anything, but for us to the community to want to think about elements of flexibility uh, because uh, we might discover, uh, you know, after the fact that uh, indeed we'll be able to do more in a uh, specific direction that was not anticipated. For sure, the opportunity to have, uh, you know, uh, that, co that coherent channel is, uh, is very intriguing. So I think that uh, it's certainly going to be a novelty that uh, will have a lot of exploitation. I uh, spoke about the, uh, the difficulty of disentangling um, that uh, in these observations uh, um, have, and, uh, um, and, and we are contending with an environment that is really uh, non-homogeneous, non-uniform, and therefore this problem is going to be with us. Um, that's where I would like to stop uh, um, for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, so uh, I, I assume then that the hydrogen SS might, might have like, excellent results over ocean now with the dual polarization, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Manuel, would you like to add anything else about the benefits and challenges of these uh, new features of or new capabilities of hydrogenesis payload? Yes, maybe I can add um, a couple of things. Uh, but first, to congratulate uh, um, all the people who have participated to this workshop, in particular to the SSL, SSLTL team uh, for this wonderful workshop. Yeah, so I, I think uh, challenges um, I see them related to calibration. Calibration is important because um, three of the four products uh, of hydrogenesis will be based on a very accurate uh, measurement of reflectivity. 
So the way we handle the calibration of the uh, strength of the direct signals, uh, the gain of the receiving antennas, both up and down, the sensitivity to the cross polar, and also the differential gain of the receivers connected to the up and the down looking antenna uh, will be crucial to get good data. And I also see a challenge in the validation uh, because SMOS and SMAP may not be there when um, HydroGenesis will be launched and CMAR will come but only a few years later. And so we will have to rely on the in situ um, measurements to validate hydrogenesis uh, products. And we have heard uh, Wolfgang Wagner how complex uh, this uh, validation is. Um, also, I see the coherent processing for inundation as a totally new um, product from hydrogenesis and uh, the combination of, of the coherent processing with the lower frequency channel, the E5 L5, which has a wider bandwidth, um, leads to the need to um, have very accurate um, estimation of the specular point uh, under topography. So we have heard some presentations on how the specular point is uh, calculated. And so this will be another, um, another challenge. And, but benefits, I, I see many benefits. Uh, I mean, we can cover the gap in case SMOS and SMAP uh, stop working between them and CMR. High resolution soil moisture is still uh, something that we have not uh, achieved so far. Um, and so below 20 kilometer resolution as hydrogenesis can provide uh, will be fantastic. Dual frequency observations at 1.17 in E5 and 1.5 in E1 may help in profiling the soil moisture into the depth of the, of the soil. This is an interesting possibility. Uh, we will we may complement the measurements done by ISA's biomass mission in Europe, US, and maybe other parts where biomass may not be working well. Um, and innovation at very high spatial resolution. And of course, as um, following what uh, Cynthia has said, uh, an opportunity for open investigations that now we cannot think of, um, offered by the polarimetric dual frequency measurements of hydrogenesis. So plenty of challenges ahead and also benefits. Thank you, Manuel. Let's move to the, the next question. I would like uh, Joaquin to tell us if, if uh, he can envisage useful collaboration and complementarity uh, with other missions, given his view of the available climate uh, data at the moment as, as responsible of ECBs at the, at the Copernicus Climate Change Service and also uh, involved in the climate data store. Um, yes, uh, thank you still very much for your question. And also, yeah, first of all, uh, echo my uh, the other panelists' uh, words and really it was a pleasure to participate today and really very happy to see all the very nice uh, scientific prospects of this vision. It's really, really great. And to respond to your question um, about complementary, uh, absolutely. I mean, um, that was one of the really words I tried to highlight today during my presentation. Uh, I mean, uh, hydrogenesis by itself, uh, it won't be able to, to, to generate climate data records. Uh, really, uh, we need long, um, long climate, uh, long uh, um, uh, climate data records. We need a lot of data, a multi sensor approach. This is a short mission and it has its limitation, of course. But again, uh, insist the, for me, the, the, the very interesting uh, thing is that uh, demonstrate really the science that hydrogenesis. I could provide and deliver its full potential through really a, a constellation of satellites. Uh, in the short term, for soil moisture, really, um, it can be really very complementary type of observation. Eh? And it has already been said by, by, uh, by Manuel now. Uh, SMAP and SMOS, they are a long time there. And the future is really very quite uncertain. It might not be there by 2024. 
So, and then we don't have the prospect of the new Sentinels with l band capability uh, to be launched until the end of this decade. So CMAR and Rose L. And also still even follow-up mission for small RF map are quite uncertain too. So best case scenario, we have SMAP and SMOS fully operational by the time the GNSS is launched. And then we still have a new type of uh, observations, a forward scattering type of observation complementing those which are based in uh, scattering and, and provided by uh, passive radiometers. So they will also increase the density of, uh, of available observations with obviously all the potential benefit uh, of it as it has been also been mentioned for example, increase of uh, resolution of the soil moisture product. And I still believe that the combination of all the different type of observations would make the better, the, the best product uh, because it will really overcome some of the weaknesses of one type of uh, observations. And worst case scenario, SMOPs and SMAP, they are not flying any longer for soil moisture. Well, then we have a, a L-band gap and in this case, in this case, hydrogenesis really could they really fill this gap. And we will look at the other uh, variables, biomass. Um, when very soon we'll have a dedicated uh, P-band mission also that uh, will measure biomass. But my understanding is that uh, there is also certain areas with restrictions where biomass won't be able to, to provide this data. And this is where also uh, hydrogenesis could also um, fill this gap uh, possibly. But again, not only that, it's just adding again to the density of all these uh, type of observations which are sensitive to vegetation. And just uh, finally, to give a, a maybe a complete view of this is, uh, I think it's very interesting uh, having one type of measurement which is sensitive to water bodies uh, hidden under dense canopies. I think the IDNSS here is really quite unique and it could be very useful. Thank you, Joaquin. I would like to ask uh, Mauro if you can um, say something else about this complementarity, but also about campaigns and and uh, the, the potential need of, of new campaigns. Uh, yes, uh, I, I agree that there are a lot of potentiality of collaboration and combination of the hydrogenous data with other data. Besides uh, biomass that has been already mentioned by Joaquin, I uh, would be very happy to try to combine uh, hydrogenesis data with NICER data, since at the time of the launch of uh, hydrogenesis, the NICER SAR from NASA should be operational. And uh, we would uh, uh, have a, a very unique opportunity to combine backscatter data tail band using NICER with uh, uh, bi-static forward scattering uh, uh, reflection uh, from hydrogenesis. And I think there are uh, different uh, me uh, scattering mechanisms, uh, uh, independent scattering mechanisms uh, that could uh, bring uh, uh, in better information by the combination of these two type of measurements. So we did some work uh, on this and the frame, for instance, of uh, an ISA mission uh, that is a SAUCOM CS. Uh, and then about uh, um, validation calibration, uh, I am going back to the Manuel uh, um, comments. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, um, Hydrogen SS uh, is uh, a small mission with a small budget. Uh, uh, as a science, uh, uh, a scientist, I cannot pretend to have uh, uh, a very well-defined, uh, um, let's say, perspective for the uh, exploitation phase, especially in terms of uh, uh, calibration, validation, data collection for for validating the products. Uh, but uh, I would uh, really be uh, recommend uh, that probably we can take advantage as a small mission uh, from the activity that uh, can uh, will be carried out in the frame of uh, a bigger mission. Uh, for instance, uh, in the frame of the biomass, uh, for sure we will have. Uh, a uh, lot of uh, data acquisition, in situ data acquisition for validation. And uh, I think with the quite limited uh, uh, 
expansion of this activity, we could make also some data collection that could be very, very valuable for hydrogen SS. This is also applied to soil moisture, of course, to all the other products. So I would strongly recommend to try to find a way to enlarge a little bit the scope of the other uh, cap, uh, of the other uh, activity on these uh, Calval uh, campaigns uh, in order to uh, be able to support also hydrogen SS for this. So I took a note on asking Isa to piggyback uh, <laughs> GNSSR activities in other bigger campaigns. <laughs> um, the next question uh, is, is about the, the collaboration or the, the combination uh, between GNSS, different GNSS reflectometry missions. I don't know if Manuel or Cynthia, uh, do you have any views on that? Uh, we understand that at the moment there are already several GNSSR missions orbiting. There will be hydrogenSS on top of, of, of this. Um, can we see some collaboration uh, between all these GNSSR different missions? And what are the, the challenges of, of such collaboration? Manuel, do you want to start first this time? Okay. Um, well, I, I think um, one way is coordinating orbits or facing satellites properly to get more uniform spatial and temporal sampling. But that I think may be difficult. Um, I would say that if every mission provides raw data sets open to the scientific community with good uh, position timing of the satellite, um, that will allow the community to uh, experience different algorithms or research or investigations and of course through presentation of results at workshop like uh, the one we we just have had uh, so that the community is aware of what is coming from all the missions available and obviously uh, following it with what john Eyre said before providing uh, data to climate and meteorological agencies as fast as possible to monitor climate change and weather. So what about the cross calibration maybe between different missions? Yes, certainly that, that's another area. Still that uh, we have seen presentations in this workshop where the NSSR soil moisture was compared to or reflectivity was compared to uh, SMOS or SMAP. So certainly that's that's another area that we can take advantage of. Yes. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, yes, what's I, your view? Yeah, I wanted to add uh, a few thoughts that are, uh, I think, in alignment with what uh, Manuel was talking about. Um, so there is right now in the in the um, U.S. environment, as I perceive it, um, you know, uh, reflectometry has been successful uh, as in most recently the, the Cygnus uh, mission that is a sort of uh, pathfinder type, right? Uh, it's not uh, one of the uh, big missions that are uh, that show up uh, in the decadal survey that uh, is done periodically that decides uh, the, uh, the directions that the NASA wants to really uh, strategize on. So it's still in that territory that I would call evolving of uh, research type of mission. Um, so there is uh, the fluidity of this environment strategically. And then uh, there is also the, uh, uh, the environment of the actors that is also very fluid. We have seen it was Cygnus that, that for the first time had uh, um, you know, uh, a, a, a disaggregated type of management of emission, right? It was not out of an NASA center. It was uh, out of a, a SWERI 
and uh, with the university. So a combination of uh, um, you know entities. We are seeing a change of paradigm that uh, is not necessarily related to reflectometry, but reflectometry is uh, in a sense uh, maybe capitalizing or uh, uh, has been even enabled by this continuous uh, change of paradigm where we have uh, indeed uh, Surrey satellite, right, was, uh, was uh, um, uh, you know, the, the first to launch a demonstrator there. These, I think, means that collaboration at this stage, in my opinion, might be more difficult to uh, make happen because of, of the, uh, um, uh, you know, the fluidity of the environment with new actors coming on board, probably new paradigms that are going to be broken in terms of small sets and whatnot, uh, models for acquiring and distributing data and whatnot, combination of government, private uh, operators and whatnot. So this being said, um, it's also always a good time to, for, for the agencies to want to consider this and uh, talking about uh, how to leverage what is going on for, uh, for a better result. So I'm not sure that right now there is anything officially happening or channels that have been open officially uh, between NASA and ESA on uh, this kind of conversations. Of course, I cannot speak for NASA, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm only seeing the, the piece of the sky that I have a visibility into through my association with the Cygnus mission. But I would encourage uh, uh, all the steps that can be taken at the agency level to capitalize upon the, the dynamic environment here of, uh, of the operators in, in reflectometry. And uh, the other piece is the science community. Because within NASA, the science community is very important. It's really the, the ability of the science community to aggregate to talk to NASA as a science community through white papers, through, of course, the mechanisms of dedicated surveys that are happening periodically, that ideas get propagated and they get to the attention of the agency. The agency has gone through lead, new leadership in earth science in the last few years. So this is also an opportune time to begin this kind of conversations. And I would encourage the community to, uh, uh, you know, take a step in, in work in this direction. Thank you, Cynthia. I think uh, your, your sentences, your con contribution um, is also related to the next question. Uh, that was the, the possible mechanisms for supporting follow-on GNSSR missions in the future if they have to be institutional or commercial. So I think that uh, partially you, you already also answered this question. Thank you. Uh, so about this last question, uh, how to uh, promote and how to um, get uh, mechanisms for supporting these follow-on uh, missions. Um, John Eyre, uh, do you have any ideas from your I do, I do. But can I comment first on the last question? Because I think there is an excellent model already for coordinating the science community. Uh, if you look at the radio occultation community, we have the International Radio Occultation Working Group, which reports to, to WMO. Um, and if you look at what that group has achieved, it's really quite remarkable. So we now get radio occultation level one data from all over the world and the users use it as though it was just one homogeneous data set almost um so it so it involves all the, all the key players that have been involved in radio occultation over the years jpl ucar umetsat gfz china and others you know and 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 the work that they have done together through the um mechanism of irog has been exceptionally good and has really help the use of that data um, as, as, as a, well, it's helped the users, but it's also helped them as a science community to 
talk to each other. So I'd I'd recommend you look at that model. Well, you know it yourself, Estelle. You've been involved in 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 that um, in that community. Um, so on your other question, um, it's something we've given a lot of thought to in the meteorological community because um, the operational meteorological community is a community um, and it doesn't like buying the same data many times so in in the interaction with the commercial world we just we're already we're trying to find our way um, with what's um, what to do um, but but with the paradigm that we want to act as a community and buy the data once and share it um, and this is already a at a European level, this means acting through UMETSAT. I mean, for for HydroGNS, clearly ESA is playing that role. They're funding funding it. They're making it available to the global community. But we talk. I think we're talking here about follow-on missions, um, where I think if you know if we if we're looking at commercial operation operational missions supported by the commercial sector, then we'd be looking. Um, to a similar model to what UMETSAT have currently established. Um, so within the next few months, we'll be starting operational flow of SPIRE radio occultation data to um, um, which will be procured by UMETSAT, in other words, by the meteorological services of Europe and made available free of charge to the world. So that's, that's a very good model. And I think we should be starting to talk now about what how we achieve the same result for um, GNSSR. Thank you, John. Uh, Martin, do you want to give the, the vision from the private industry? Well, I, I, I think it's, um, I mean, it's heartening to hear uh, these comments because uh, we, we are trying to find the right level. I think there are some things that some organizations do very well and there are some gaps which are left and I guess it's trying to address those gaps so uh, I mean we've seen um, the work that ESA has done and NASA has done and I'm sure it's the same in other countries as well where um, they like to do new things explore things find new things to do and and hydrogen SS is ex in that category it's got some foundational measurements which um, are, are common to previous missions but it's also got the new measurements and um, which are exploring new science and so it's a, a good combination but then beyond that it, it it I guess that's more Copernicus's role but that tends to be good at doing the the, the large missions which take a decade to plan uh, and so the small satellites are kind of left out of that and and if you look at the commercial sector that's probably best at where you have a single customer and it's fairly regional and then you can actually put a business case together the problem comes when you have global climate measurements and then it's very difficult to find an anchor customer and i think what's been happening with the radio occultation is probably the closest thing that we have seen that can provide a, an anchor customer um, and I think it's it's something that needs work on. It's it's how to how do you value climate measurements? Because clearly one of the good things about these um, ESA and NASA missions is it's brought all these people together. You've seen all these contributors from the ESA missions, from the NASA missions. They're all working together. Where, whereas that's not necessarily how commercial organisations tend to work. Um, so it's trying to get the balance between the two. And the other possibility is to get more players involved at a national level but at a low cost and a rapid level so perhaps uh, smaller satellites that can contribute towards um, these measurements from different organizations so that's another possible mechanism um, so every reflectometry satellite counts and it's all able to increase the um, ability of the whole so we're looking for ideas along those lines thank you martin um, I think that's the end of the roundtable, and maybe someone at the SSTL wants to close the, the workshop. Um, yes, thank you, Estelle, for excellent uh, chairing of that um, roundtable session, and thank you to all the contributors, uh, some really uh, insightful 
comments for us to all take away uh, and uh, reflect on uh, for the benefits of the whole community there. I, I think um, certainly uh, from the Hydrogen SS team side, we, we intend to, to make, a, make a difference to the science community uh, for, the, for the benefit of, of climate change. So we're greatly looking forward to delivering that, uh, the mission uh, and, um, and providing the, the data into the science community. Uh, for the benefit of all so i think um i think it's been an excellent two days i've certainly um learned a lot it's been very interesting uh, from a personal point of view and scientifically uh feedback is is very good so we feel it's uh, it's been a, a, a great uh, workshop um i think uh that just leaves me uh to uh, thank all contributors and everybody who's um, taken the time out to um to stay with us uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, hosting one in the future. So the, the next workshop would be um, run prior to, uh, to launch. Um, so sometime in, in, in 2024, seems like a long way away, um, but we, we need to uh, get on with the hard work of um, uh, developing the, the program and, and putting the satellite together um, so yeah so without further ado i think we can conclude that the the workshop is uh, is closed and um thank you all for your attendance and participation goodbye